How can what we know about attachment and the power of our emotions create deeper intimacy and resolve conflicts with your partner? In today's episode, you're going to learn about a particular kind of conversation that you can have with your partner and that will change everything. First, Relationship Alive is my offering to you so that you can have the best relationship possible. If you're finding the show to be helpful, please consider a donation to help support our mission. To choose something that feels right for you, please visit neilsatin.com slash support or text the word support to the number 33444 and follow the instructions. And this week, a big thank you goes out to Kelly, Kent, Sarah, Renee, and Ruthanna. Thank you all so much for your generous contributions to ensure that we can keep the lights on here at Relationship Alive headquarters. Also, if you haven't downloaded it yet, be sure to pick up my free guide to my top three relationship communication secrets. When it comes to staying present and communicating effectively in all your conversations with your partner, these three tips will help you stay connected no matter how challenging the topic. And as I mentioned, the guide is free. To download your copy, just visit neilsatin.com slash relate or text the word relate to the number 33444 and follow the instructions to download the guide. If you're looking for support in your relationship and you happen to be on Facebook, come join the Relationship Alive community where there are more than 2,400 listeners gathered to create a safe space to support each other in our relationships. And one last thing before we get started. This episode is also brought to you by ModCloth. To get 15% off your purchase of $100 or more, go to M-O-D-C-L-O-T-H dot com, that's modcloth.com, and enter the code ALIVE at checkout. This offer is valid for one-time use only and expires on March 3rd, 2019. I think that's it for now, so let's get on with the show. Hello and welcome to another episode of Relationship Alive. This is your host, Neil Satin. We've spoken a lot on this show about attachment and the way that attachment influences how we operate in our lives and in our relationships. And I wanted to bring back one of the masters of showing us how to use what we know about attachment in relationship to the show to talk about her new online program and also to answer some questions from you because we uh, had some people in the Facebook group chime in with questions for this illustrious guest who has been with us several times before. Her name is Sue Johnson. You probably know her as the creator of Emotionally Focused Couples Therapy or EFT, which is how we'll refer to it in this episode. She was here in episode 27, talking about how to break free from patterns of conflict. She was here in episode 82, talking about how creating safety in your relationship leads to better sex. And we had the double hitter in episode 100 with her and John Gottman, both talking about how to sustain and revive attraction in your relationship. Today, we're going to focus on uh, Hold Me Tight, which is one of Sue's breakthrough books that explains how couples can take this journey, these several conversations that they can have that lead them into deeper intimacy, both in terms of understanding themselves in relationship, also um, how to work through conflict, forgiveness, sex, you name it. It's there in the book. And this has all been rolled out recently in an online program called Hold Me Tight Online. We're going to talk more about that. Um, Sue also has a book coming out right around the beginning of 2019 on attachment theory in practice. And this is using emotionally focused therapy with individuals and families as well as couples. So we may touch on that a little bit and hopefully we'll also get to have Sue back to chat when that book comes out. 
I think that's enough from me in the meantime. If you want to download a transcript of this episode, uh, please visit neilsatin.com slash sue and then the number three. So that's S-U-E and then the number three. Or as always, you can text the word passion to the number 33444 and follow the instructions to get the transcript for this episode and our other episodes. Also, if you are interested in the online program um, that Sue is going to be talking about, you can visit neilsatin.com slash hold me tight. And that will take you to a page where you can find out more about Sue Johnson's Hold Me Tight online program. Sue, thank you so much for sitting through that long introduction. And it's such a pleasure to have you here again with us on Relationship Alive. Oh, it's always nice to be with you. Well, we have a lot to talk about today, and we'll do our best to be succinct. Um, And I also want to encourage you listening that you don't have to, we're not going to go over all the finer points of what we've already talked about. Those other episodes are there for you to listen to. Um, But Sue, maybe we could start by just talking about what is emotionally focused therapy? What makes it unique from other ways that people might be used to working with therapists or understanding themselves? Um, Emotionally focused therapy, um, as the title suggests, um, it it basically works from the premise that the most powerful thing in a in a in a relationship um, is the emotional music that's playing. The emotional music is what structures a relationship. It's what organizes a relationship, d- defines sort of. L- you know, leads the partners to dance in a particular way with each other. So it's sort of um, dedicated to the idea that if you want to understand relationships and if you want to shape your relationship intentionally, whether to repair it or whether to just simply keep it strong, it's very important to understand the emotion that's going on when you dance with your partner. It's important to be able to deal with that emotion in a way that pulls your partner towards you. It's important to understand the impact you have on your partner. So EFT really has focused on making emotion the couples and the therapist friend and shown therapists and couples how to understand that emotion, how to deal positively with emotion, and how to use emotion to feel more connected with your partner. And I think the fact that we know how to use emotion and we honor emotion um, in our work with couples is one of the reasons why the other special thing about EFT is that we have a fantastic amount of research on outcome. We have over 20 studies, positive outcome studies, which makes us unique in the field of couple therapy. We're the gold standard of research in couples therapy. We do not have a problem with relapse in our research, which is which is pretty amazing, really. It always surprises me every time we do a study and we find no evidence of relapse because all, you know, the, the sort of elephant in the room in couples therapy is that even if you can create change with a couple, you see them in a month's time or in six months' time and They've kind of relapsed. They've gone back to being distressed, and that's not the case in our therapy. So it's unique in that it's based on research in terms of intervention. We've been doing this for 35 years now. It's um, it's unique in the way it deals with the most potent thing in the room, which is emotion. But in the end, the real thing that I think makes EFT different is that it's not based on some sort of uh, somebody's idea about what love is or what relationships are all about. Um, It's based on hundreds and hundreds of studies of um, adult bonding. It's based on a science of love. And so we have a map to what matters in relationships, what goes wrong, and exactly what you have to do to put it right. And that means that the EFT therapist is on target. Um, We expect to create change. We expect our partners to grow. 
We expect our couples' relationships to look not only a little happier, but more secure and be more stable at the end of therapy. Um, you know, it's it, it, from, obviously I'm biased here because I'm talking about <laughs> my own work. I'm talking about 35 years of research, you know, um, and clinical work. Um, but, um, you know, the truth is that we, we're the only approach to couple and family therapy that's based on a, a real science of relationships. And that science is, uh, is attachment and bonding. And I think also because of that science, we, um, in this model, we, um, the model suggests that together we're much more powerful than we are individually and it values and honors connection between people. And so EFT practitioners and ICEF, the, the International Center for Excellence in EFT, which is our not-for-profit organization, um, basically the headquarters are here in Canada, we've created communities all over the world. Uh, I think we have about 66 right now um, affiliated with us to um, support therapists and health professionals to learn EFT, to get together and support each other, to help each other grow, to help um, therapists in those communities contribute to relationship education. Um, you know, we, we believe in creating community, and I think that's something special about EFT. We do that wherever we go. The, the latest community that looks like it's going to take off is in Iran. Wow. You know, and um, that's fascinating because, of course, attachment science – is um, about who we are as human beings. It's attachment science applies to all of us, right. uh, regardless yeah. of regardless of tribe, religion, political persuasion, race, gender. It uh, attachment science basically is based on biology, and it tells us who we are as human beings, what our most basic needs are. So. Um, that's a bit of a mouthful, but that's what's special about EFT. Right, Sue, I <laughs> asked you for the short version. Come on. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Okay, well, that's very hard, Neil. Uh, you know how passionate I am about what I do and how successful we are. So how can I – I'm sorry, that's the shortest I can manage, okay? No, that's great. And and uh, I one thing that I really appreciate about the experience that you offer couples who are going through EFT is that it literally does – bring them along on an experience that allows them to feel each other in a different way, to feel each other's emotions in a yes. different context, and to to have that experience of getting through situations that are really tender or challenging or triggering and get to the other side in a way that is really constructive for their relationship and for their for their bonding. Yes. And you know, I mean, we're talking about therapy here, but I know that later in the program, we're going to talk about Hold Me Tight. Yes. But, you know, uh, um, the Hold Me Tight educational program is based on my book, Hold Me Tight, and I put that relational program together. It's There's groups all over the countries and all these um, communities run by therapists or even people who aren't therapists, you know, pastors, you know, anyone can actually um, buy the program and run the group, you know, a hold me tight group. And what always blows my mind when I go and do one of these groups, I think the biggest one I've ever done was with a um, hundred couples at a time in, in um, San Francisco. And what always blows my mind is uh, people come up to you in the groups. Usually, usually I do them over a weekend, you know, and they, they go through the conversations that we, we teach them, you know, in the book. And people come up to you and they say things like, well, we just came because we were curious. We don't even have any real huge issues in our relationship. And I thought that our relationship was pretty good. But um, this group experience has taken our relationship into places I never even knew existed. I just had this, one of these beautiful ones last week. This person sent me an email you know, we didn't even know um, that we could have this kind of closeness and this kind of emotional connection. And 
um, we feel like it's changed how we'll be with each other in the future. So thank you. And I think what they're talking about is the profound, profound effect of being able to help people move into profound bonding conversations. Um, they are the conversations. Uh, they are this is sort of biologically prepared, powerful experience. These are the conversations that our nervous system is wired to resonate to. These are the conversations that our brain says, yes, this is safe and this is close and this is, this is what I want and need. You know, this is what gives me... Um, the ability to stand up in the world and be strong and people resonate with them. They just, they, they're, they're powerful, powerful experiences. And that's why we don't get relapse because your brain, if you know how to have these bonding conversations, you remember them that like you don't, they're not just something you put aside and say, Oh, that was interesting, but I don't think about it anymore. Your whole nervous system zings with the memory of them. And once you've had these experiences, your, your brain wants you to go back there. So, you know, bonding experiences are, we remember them all our lives. We remember the moments when we were vulnerable and our father turned and held us and said something to us. We remember that all our lives. We hold on to it. We go back to it when we're unhappy and sad we go back to it with a thrill of joy. You know, um, these experiences are our core to, to what we need as human beings. So when you help people move into them in therapy or in an educational group or even online together in the privacy of their own home, um, there's something very profound about that and and truly growth producing for individuals and for couples about that. Um, and, you know, attachment science has shown us um, how to get there, how, how to, you know, if we really understand who we are as human beings, of course, we, we can craft powerful transformative experiences, right? Um, and that's, I mean, that, that's the thing that um, keeps me passionate about this work. You know, EFT is passionate in general. And I, I want to take our listeners on this journey a little bit today. We'll give them a taste of, of this kind of experience. Um, but before we do, I'm curious about how do you get when someone isn't along for the ride? You know, and this is often the case in, in a couple, right, where one person hears Sue Johnson on Relationship Alive and says, we got to find an EFT therapist or we got to <laughs> buy this book, Hold Me Tight or whatever it is, right? And the other person is maybe just like, yeah, I don't buy that therapy stuff or um, sounds sounds really like unhealthy codependence. Like, you know, th when people come at it with their negative bias about it or maybe they're just you know, stonewalling and they're, you know, shut down to the influence of their partner in that in, in the at this stage in their relationship. How do you help enlist the the partner in in actually wanting or hopefully inviting them to participate in something like this? Oh, um, well that happens quite a lot. You know, even when people come for therapy sometimes they're kind of being dragged there. Right. You know, you can tell they're like, you know, waiting they're in the room with their teeth gritted and they're, <laughs> you know, they're just sort of wanting to wait for you to stop talking so they can explain how they, they've got to leave now. You know, that's how you feel. Um, what we do in EFT is what we, we always do. We start where people are. We, um, it's an incredible mistake from an EFT point of view to um, start telling people to be different you just become dangerous when you do that and they'll protect themselves against you. So we start where we are and um, I can give, an, for example, I 
just did a session with um, an Inuit um, couple and, you know, um, we started with the fact that um, to sit and talk to somebody like me is definitely not part of Inuit male culture. And we talked about the fact that from his point of view, the very best way of dealing with any problem was to go hunting. <laughs> yeah. And um, I talked about that with him. I didn't explain therapy. That's the wrong channel. He's, in, he's not interested in getting information from me. He's not even interested in it. So we talked about hunting and we talked about what that did for him and how when he hunted, he felt competent and he he was out in a bitter environment, but he was somehow in charge. And, and then we talked about how strange it was for him to even think about sitting and talking about his emotions with someone like me, you know, or reading the Hold Me Type book. And um, as I joined with him and listened to him and had him teach me about how he dealt with his emotions, engaged other people, dealt with his needs for closeness, how he dealt with his vulnerability, which is you can't get out of those things. They're universal, right? Unless you're a, <clears throat> unless you're a, a lizard or something, you have to be actively engaged with those three things. Um, you know, as we sat and talked about it, he became more open and um, I said, oh, like, well, your hunting, it sounds like your hunting has saved your life. It sounds like your hunting has really done a lot for you. And I think it's wonderful that you've been able to do that. And you're right. I can't offer you that experience. So, you know, um, so would you like to talk to, are you curious at all? And, you know, maybe I can help you feel some of the same kind of uh, sure, because he talked in words like sureness and um, ground under his feet, and he used these images. So I said, well, maybe I could help you <clears throat> find some of that sense of sureness and ground under your feet when um, you're talking to your lady and you see that she's disappointed with you, which I'm hearing is, one of the moments where you decide to go hunting. <laughs> <laughs> and he was, and he, I'd listened to him. He'd listened to me. He experienced me as safe. I wasn't, you know, telling him how to be. And so um, he said, yes, that would be interesting, you know, and, and, and he starts to look me in the eye and he starts to, um, you know, look up at me more and he starts to, and we, he's suddenly engaged and we begin. We begin with, you know, what would he like to change in his relationship and <clears throat> what is happening to him in those moments in the relationship. We begin with his pain. We begin with, with the dilemmas that he would like a solution to. And we go slowly because in his culture, um, that's the way it works. You, you, you know, you, 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 you speak slowly and you, you deal with things at a slow pace. So we go slowly and, um, and gradually he comes, he becomes curious. So you start where people are, you validate their uncertainty, their reluctance. If you think about it just in very human terms, the last thing you want to do if you're uncertain and vulnerable is to go to talk to some strange professional person about that. You know, you're, you're worried about being shamed. You're worried about them telling you that there's something wrong with you. You're worried about what they're going to tell you about their relationship. You know, it's, um, you don't feel safe. Right, and of course what's challenging about these conversations when they happen just between partners in a relationship is that um, they're so often very quickly triggering conversations. That's right. That's right. The partner hears 
well, you don't even care enough about our relationship to go and talk to somebody about it. So that just proves what a creep you are, you know, and, and you people get stuck there, you know. Um, but, you know, what we're talking about is also another reason why I went to all the trouble to try and create the Hold Me Tight program, educational program, because I assume that even though couple therapy is becoming a bit more normative, there are a huge number of people who would rather have their feet roasted in an oven than come to couple therapy, right? And mm -hmm. they won't come. So we said, okay, so I said, okay, then maybe they'd come to a group put on by their pastor in their church or, you know, maybe they'd come to a group put on in the local hall with, you know, 10 other couples or, and then it went to, no, there's a whole bunch of people who won't come to that either. <laughs> Because so, we, you know, in our culture, we hide our vulnerability or our uncertainty. And so I said, okay, well, then there's a whole bunch of people. Maybe they do an online program that's friendly and fun. And they do it in the, the, the you know, their own homes where they don't, they feel safe and private. So then, of course, we, we that leaves us putting all the energy into creating an online and I think what we're talking about here is the EFT commitment. Um, or I'll just put it, make it personal, my commitment. Um, the commitment in this model, and if you're an attachment theorist, is not just to provide, create a very good model, research it, and teach people about it, which is big enough. You know, we've been doing that for 35 years. The commitment is that... Um, as a psychological approach, as a that we have something to offer society, and that we can um, help society learn to honor and value relationships, shape better relationships. You know, that's what we're trying to do. So, therapy, education. I think the main issue here that we're up against, that where the person asked the question, is that. Um, our society, our culture, um, has not seen love relationships as something that are is uh, are understandable, are shapeable, that you can shape, that you can learn to create, that you can nurture deliberately with intention. Yeah, you know, we we don't talk about love like that. We say you fall in, you fall out, and um, we've basically had a, a very narrow mistaken view of romantic love relationships and I think who we are as human beings. So people, they really don't see, relate. they not only, I'm not sure a therapist can help or a group can help, they really don't see love as something that you can craft and shape and understand. And we're trying to change that. We're trying to you know, we're trying to, to have an impact on that. Yeah, and I, I think that's one reason why we resonate, you and I, so so much is, yeah. you know, that that's definitely part of part of my mission and Relationship Alive's mission in the world as well, um, to, to affect that transformation, because that is definitely uh, a big deal, that there are a lot of people who don't quite understand that you can actually adjust things in ways that are that are actually helpful. Um, it, uh, sadly, I think a lot of people have the story that, you know, they know of a couple that tried therapy and it just blew up their marriage or that sort of thing. So it's just, you know, one positive experience at a time, I think, and the way that that ripples out into, into the world yeah. that, that people get the sense of, oh, actually we know a lot more about how to do this than we did. 20 years ago and yes that's why and we're that's, having this conversation right and that's the message we keep trying to get out there and you know it's so interesting um the news is always focused on on bad news you know um that's what the news wants to report but i always say i i don't really understand it's beyond me why at some point it hasn't been all over the front of the new york times that we now have a science of romantic love, of love, period, that we now understand it. We have an incredible 
theory and science about what it's all about, that, you know, attachment started off with looking at the bonding between mother and child, and now it's grown. In the last 15 years, it's been applied to adult relationships, and it really has so much to say about who we are and what we need to thrive and survive and how we are relational beings and how to create good, loving relationships. And surely this is revolutionary. Surely this is at least as important as understanding DNA. I think so. It's at least page two, you know, if not the front page. I think it's the headline. (laughs) I think it's much more important than us putting all this energy into going in rockets to the stars. Why don't we learn to become you know, powerful, bonded, connected, cooperating human beings on this planet, maybe we wouldn't need to go to the stars. (laughs) Yeah, I hear you. I totally hear you there. Um, And this makes me wonder, too, because, right, there needs, who you know, I want to befriend that person or persons who decide what goes on the front page of the New York Times. and, And if I meet that person, I'll put in a good word for you, Sue. Oh, sure, okay. And... And I, I'm thinking that often what brings what what brings uh, light on a particular subject is not how amazing it is, although sometimes that is true, but often it's the controversy that accompanies it. Yeah. And and that makes me wonder for you, your own perspective on what I think some people do still perceive as a controversy between attachment theory in relationships and how important it is to understand the science of bonding and differentiation and people learning to stand on their own two feet and and yeah. taking responsibility for themselves and the interplay of those things. Yeah. Um, yeah. So well, go ahead. Well, we basically, I think we in psychology have a huge responsibility here because We didn't know enough, and so we set those things up. We set up being a strong individual and acknowledging your need for others as dichotomies. We set them up like they're on opposite sides of a long line, right? Like they're opposites. And, of course, they're not. That is a mistaken way of looking at it. All the research, and I'm talking about thousands of studies now, all the research since about 1960 uh, points to the fact that the bottom line is the more securely connected to others you are, the more um, sure you are of yourself, the more, um, if you like, the more securely connected you are, the more articulated, coherent, and positive your sense of self is. So you find out who you are, you differentiate with others, not from others. There is no, if you look at the differentiation literature, it almost implies that there's a point in time where you just decide to look in the mirror and define yourself and Uh, tell yourself you're great and that you kind of can self-soothe and you can do all this for yourself. This is nonsense. This is not who we are. We never get to that point. And the only people who look in the mirror and totally define themselves and tell themselves they're wonderful and don't need other people, we call them psychopaths. You know, and they're not particularly known for being for for, uh, being wonderful members of society or particularly happy. Uh, it's, It's a mistake we made because we didn't have the big picture. We just saw a little foot of the elephant that said that um, our needs, if they're expressed in negative ways, can get us into trouble. Our needs for others can get us into trouble. And indeed, that's true. You know, but that's what we saw. So, you know, um, in family therapy, for example, we focused on, you know, issues like enmeshment. And that's so interesting because um, we don't do that when we work with families in EFT. We focus on, you know, how people deal with their anxiety and we help them 
move into that anxiety and hold it and regulate it and be able to express that anxiety in ways that are um, not coercive to other people and not um, demeaning for themselves and ways that pull the other people close and they grow and the relationships grow. You know, I mean, that's, that's what we do and we do it all the time. So we don't find enmeshment or codependency particularly useful concepts. Um, we just see it that people are stuck being anxious about the safety of their relationships. And when you're anxious, you either get all upset and try to yell and scream and demand and control things, or you tend to shut down and numb out. And neither of them are useful. They don't get you what you need. And, you know, um, I, I think what I'm saying is it's a much more integrated and rounded out and complete picture of differentiation and individuation and self-soothing that you get from taking the whole picture of attachment and bonding in context. It's the little child who knows the mother will come if he calls, who goes out and believes that he can run down the slide and who manages um, his distress if he finds that maybe he falls off the slide he knows that if he calls, his mum will come. He's in a safe universe where he feels loved and held. And his mother has come a number of times. So he's learned that distress is manageable and that he can manage it and that he can call for another. He's internalized that sense of, of safety in the world. And, you know, he will grow up with a stronger sense of self and a stronger ability to go out into the world and take risks. Um, you know, this isn't um, a theory. This is, um, you know, there's thousands of studies on this now. This isn't a theory. You know, securely attached people who know how to trust others and reach for others and who believe that others will be there for them um, consistently have a better self-image they take, they're more able to take risks. They're more able to face the world. They're more resilient. They're basically, if you like, more differentiated. So this, this dichotomy is a false one. And it's really about the old theories of human functioning, which are kind of in boxes. You know, we've never had the, the, the whole picture coming up, up against the new approach to um, looking at human beings, which is attachment, um, you know, and it's really the conflict between the old and the new there. Uh, and, and there doesn't have to be a conflict at all is what I'm saying. Right. I appreciate that, that you've, you've, I think, shown very clearly how they're, how they include each other, that yeah. one, one comes with the other. And as soon as you split them apart, that's when they start, either one starts to become a little dysfunctional. I think on emotional level, it really isn't about that. I think on an emotional level, it's about the fact that we all know that when we that if we need another, that introduces a level of vulnerability. Yeah. And I think, especially in our society, we don't want to talk about that vulnerability. We want to believe that we're invulnerable. And, you know, society says you're supposed to be able to soothe yourself, deal with everything, live a life at 50 miles an hour, have everything. So we, we, we want to believe we're invulnerable. And what attachment really says is that's not the way to real strength. Real strength is to understand where you're vulnerable, understand the essence of your vulnerability, which is also a beautiful thing in human beings understand their need for closeness, their, their, the way they, they be able to tune into others and your own need for closeness and accept that vulnerability and then know how to deal with it positively. That is real strength, not the denial of vulnerability. Yeah, and this makes me think of the hold me tight conversation. And, yeah. and I love how, you know, in our, in our very first conversation where we talked about 
changing your your conflict patterns. We we talked a lot about um, discovering your your demon dialogues and sort of the first three conversations that that are part of the the hold me the overall hold me tight sequence. Yes. But then I'm thinking of the fulcrum really of of hold me tight sitting in the middle. So could we talk for a moment about what is the the hold me tight conversation that <laughs> yeah. happens and and yeah. why is that so important? Well, what happens in a hold me tight conversation is um, you have already or what if you're if you're helping a couple create one, uh, it doesn't matter whether you're doing it in therapy or in an educational group or uh, in an online program before you ask people to go into a homie tight conversation, <laughs> you have helped them create a certain safety and sense of trust in their relationship uh, because you cannot do a hold me tight conversation while you are vigilant for danger, waiting for a negative pattern like some sort of waiting to deal with an attack from your partner or, you know, just waiting for your partner to let you down when you're on guard you can't move into a hold me tight conversation. So you have to have a certain sense of safety first. And that's, we've learned to take you there, right, in EFT, um, in all the various forms of EFT. But once you have that, um, really what a hold me tight conversation does is it moves people gradually into the, th the, the three elements that we know are key to a bonding conversation. What defines the safety of a bond in a relationship is how emotionally accessible, um, responsive, and engaged you are. A-R-E, accessible, responsive, and engaged. And I always relate it to that the key question in love relationships is, are you there for me? A-R-E, are you accessible? Are you open? Um, are you responsive to me? Will you tune in to me? Will you move towards me when I call? Am I important enough that you'll tune in to me and pay attention to me? Do you care about my needs? Will you engage me? Will you come and meet me on the dance floor? Maybe struggle, even if I'm struggling with me. You know, are you committed to really being with me in a dance, even if we're caught in a negative dance? So hold me tight conversations really create that emotional openness, that ability to send messages to each other that evoke empathy and caring, help the other person respond, that help us see that vulnerability in our partner and respond with what they need and help us stay engaged even when that engagement gets hard. And it's really about, um, being able to talk about, in the end, it's a conversation about <clears throat> your fears. And we all have the same fears in the relationships. We're all terrified of rejection and abandonment. Um, those things are wired in. It, it doesn't say, it, it's nothing to do with personality strength or, or anything. It's to do with the fact that we're bonding animals and abandonment and rejection are danger cues to our mammalian brain, they're, they're life-threatening, literally. We're born so vulnerable when our brain is being formed. We know, like we know how to take our next breath, that if we are totally rejected or abandoned and left, we die. We know we're at risk, and we never lose that sense. So this vulnerability is wired in, and we're all afraid of rejection and abandonment. So we have these fears. And how we deal with these fears really has a lot to do with how we end up engaging others. And then it's not, but it's not just about how we deal with our fears. It's about whether we can actually know how or have had the experience of being able to actually pinpoint our needs, our needs for connection, comfort, support, caring, our needs um, just to share our reality to, to find out how valid it is, right? Um, that's such a human, human need 
to be able to share our needs, pinpoint them and share them in a way that our partner can hear them and pulls our partner close to us. So in the end, a bonding conversation is about sharing your vulnerabilities, your fears and your needs in a way that helps your partner respond and come close and helps you and them become accessible, responsive and engaged on an emotional level. And that is the essence of, of bonding. Yeah. And powerful conversations where powerful conversations that can change the way you see yourself, the way you see other people, the way you experience your world. So this conversation that's about talking about your fears, sharing your needs and your vulnerabilities with your partner. And I, and I love how you, the important thing kind of comes at the end there, which is in a way that invites your partner closer. Yeah. And I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about what allows that to happen versus, because I think some people might hear that and think, oh God, like my partner is already so needy and vulnerable. Like they're needy all the time. So I want them to be more needy. You know, like how's that going to work? So no, it's not about being more needy. It's about being able to um, hold on to your emotional balance and um, own your needs and then ask for them to be met. And that is very different from what most of us see as the norm in relationships, you know, um, which is, you know, I expect my, for most of us, it's like, I expect my partner, if my partner loves me, my partner already knows my needs. That's a huge myth in relationships. Um, and what we want to do is we want our partner to, um, respond to those needs without us having to actually show that we need because, in our society, we've been taught that showing that you need is somehow shameful or not okay, or it means you're immature or whatever it means. It means you're not an independent adult, whatever that is. So most of us don't want to show our needs, and we don't quite know how to talk about them. And so then, of course, we're massively surprised that the message doesn't come across to our partner. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's, it's quite humbling to write these books and do all these training tapes and do all these studies and then, um, you know, talk to your own partner or your own children, your own son, and hear yourself uh, doing exactly the same things that, you know, that we all do and that couples do and that, you know, um, you just hear yourself rather than turning and, and telling your partner that you're feeling upset by something and you would like to be, reassured and comforted you you hear yourself um turn and get accusatory or demanding or give advice or start telling your partner they should know better you know having been married to you all these years and read hold me tight a few times <laughs> <laughs> you know, they should know better and they should be a more supportive right now which of course i'm asking for support in a way where i have a hammer in my hand and so my partner just looks at the hammer and backs off. Um, uh, you, we get stuck. We get stuck in these dances because we're not tuning into our own emotional music or our partners. We we don't make it easy often for our partner to see what we really need. And then when we don't get what we need, we're not very good at keeping our emotional balance and and dealing with that. We get very agitated and attack or criticize or we shut down and numb out and neither of those things work you know it's um what a good science does is it tells you um how to look at basic phenomena in the world and understand them and how they work and you know attachment science tells us how we work emotionally and how relationships work and you know giving advice to your partner telling your partner what to do explaining to your partner that they're somehow inadequate <laughs> <laughs> that doesn't work right we i mean that might be more comfortable for us than pausing for a minute taking a breath 
getting our emotional balance and saying, what is happening with me? Why am I getting so agitated here? And then realizing that we are off balance. We're on our back foot. And we need someone to reassure us or just calm us for a moment. And, you know, being able to slow things down. And that's a lot of it, actually. The emotion is fast and um, sometimes it's overwhelming for us and we either numb it out or we get carried away with it. Being able to keep your balance and slow things down and say, ah, I'm finding that very difficult, getting this letter that um, is telling me, you know, that I'm maybe not going to be considered for this promotion. I was pretending it didn't matter to me, but in fact, I'm finding it very difficult indeed, and um, what I really need is to be able to tell my partner somehow I feel kind of small right now because I expected to get an interview immediately and, you know, I expected everyone to be delighted to interview me and I'm feeling pretty small and I I just need some support and reassurance. That's That's not what... Um, occurs to us we get irritable or so there's lots of ways not to connect unfortunately <laughs> there's lots right. and, and we do them anyway even when we sort of know lots of information in our prefrontal cortex you know we still get stuck right because that part of our brain is like turned off when we're in those moments of distress and i'm wondering for you especially because you so graciously pointed out that that you may have moments where you don't act quite by the book what are your what are your best ways what are your favorite kind of go-tos in your relationship for regrouping when things have gone off the rails a little bit um and i'm looking for kind of your specific like ways you bring yourself back into balance, ways you take responsibility for what just happened and and kind of corral the the interaction back into a more well, generative space. Yeah, it's interesting because, you know, I mean, basically I tune into all the things I've learned in EFT, but, you know, I can't, that takes a while. So <laughs> <laughs> I mean, if you ask me what my fast route out of that is, I'm usually able to see the, the sort of, um, you know, the few minutes of interaction and I'm able to see um, the, the, the negative pattern that I'm, I'm not actually asking for what I need. I'm usually able to see it. This I should be able to do this after, you know, watching thousands of couples and all kinds of research studies. And so I'm able to sort of see, I put, I put my, my, my vision expands, if you like, from the little tiny piece of interaction that I just had or my feeling of frustration um, that I'm feeling. Um, I listen to what I just said to my partner and and I'm able to hear it in a broader context or see, wait a minute, you know, that 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 doesn't work. You know, that's I this is not the dance I want to be in. So I somehow have to have a sense of that, that, you know, I'm somehow getting stuck in some sort of narrow place that isn't going where I want to go, which is to feel safer, sounder, more connected, reassured, you know. Um, I, somehow I know I'm going in the wrong direction. And then one way of thinking about it that I've been thinking about lately, and I've written about it in my new book that's coming out in January, which is a, a professional book, is I change channel. I've changed channel from just coping with the emotion and somehow putting it out to my partner in, you know, a way that I'm just putting it out. I'm not actually thinking about, you know, how to really connect with him with that emotion that I change channel. And usually what that means is I change into um, listening to my emotion differently and, you know, being able to stay with the softer feelings. So, you know, um, you know, being, and, and I think that's what people do in general when they can do these things. You know, they move 
from um, somehow lecturing their partner or complaining or pointing out issues or, uh, you know, just saying a few things and hoping their partner are going to guess, they move into being able to name their emotions and to say or describe them in very simple ways, like I feel small or I feel uncertain right now or for some reason I'm feeling really uncomfortable, maybe even a, a bit scared and I don't quite know why. They trust themselves enough, they trust their partner enough that they can go into those softer feelings. And when they do, when they move into that emotional space, emotion just, it's like the picture evolves. You know, it's like what you're scared of becomes clearer, um, what you need becomes clearer. You know, and when you turn and change channel into that sort of um, deeper, more open emotion, you give different signals. It's just natural if you stay there. You know, saying to someone, um, for some reason, you know, that conversation I had with that person left me feeling really, really frazzled and uncomfortable and even a bit scared, and I don't know why. That That is an invitation to empathy and connection. Um, that's completely different from, I've had a bad day and you're not helping. I thought you were going to cook supper. And, you know, what I hope is underneath all my bad temper, you're going to see that I really need some help and comfort. But unfortunately, you don't, you see. <laughs> you just see that I'm dangerous and you you avoid me. Right. right? And, and Which is exactly what you don't need in that moment. Yeah. We are not wired to deal with our vulnerability by ourselves. Uh, we can do it if we have to for short periods of time. But um, we're not wired, and it's not the most efficient and effective way of dealing with our human vulnerabilities. It's not the strongest or best way to deal with our human vulnerabilities. We're wired with social bonding animals. We're wired to connect with other people. Um, you know, we're stronger together, you know. And what, um, what I hear you saying, too, is that by changing the channel, you're basically going from the channel that's all about, I'm having this emotion and I'm expressing it on you, to the channel of, I'm realizing that I'm having this emotion, and if I wanted to connect with my partner in this moment, and around the fact that this is how I'm feeling, how would I do that? Which invites maybe a different, a, a totally different course of action in that moment. Yeah, but I don't think it's as deliberate as you're making it sound here. Usually in the first instance, people are being reactive. They're, they're sort of giving, they're actually coping with softer emotions by shutting down or being very sort of, um, you know, just giving facts or getting angry and becoming demanding. Um, they're actually, those are coping devices really the 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 real core emotion underneath is not spoken and so then the partner doesn't see it and doesn't see the need that that core emotion speaks to right mm -hmm. um uh, i mean there's a lot of conversation about this too there's all kinds of conversations in our field about how you know um empathy and how you Empathy is a skill, and you have to teach empathy skills, and you have to train for it. I'm sorry, I don't think so. Empathy is wired into us. It's there. What we have to do is understand what blocks it. And the main thing that blocks it is I can't be empathic to my partner if I'm too busy dealing with my own overwhelming emotions. If most of the glucose going to my brain is dealing with my own discomfort, fear, uncertainty, um, you know, I'm, I don't have any room to tune into my partner's emotions. So what we, I don't think we teach empathy. We model empathy, I guess, but, um, and you know, in, in hold me tight groups uh, and in the online program, people will, see models of couples interacting with empathy and connection. But in the end, 
you know, it's really about what blocks it, how you put out your, your message that blocks your partner's natural empathy or how you can talk to your partner in a way that evokes that empathy. You know, it's um, people are naturally empathic and responsive. So in EFT, we just understand the blocks and we help um, people dance in a way that those blocks don't come up or to see beyond those blocks. It, I guess that sounds a bit abstract, but I think I think it's clear. Yeah, and I think that's getting at the heart of the question that I asked you uh, a few minutes ago around how do you have the hold me tight conversation, a conversation where you're able to to tell your partner about your vulnerabilities and your fears and your needs without it coming across as being a demand or being needy, mm. that it, it comes out of that place of of being aware of your feelings and 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 seeking I think you've said it a couple times now, the the softer emotions that are underneath the the things that are on the surface. Yes. And I think the other thing about that is a big part of EFT is it's a lot easier to do that if you if you grasp those emotions and you um, have them normalized and validated and you don't see those emotions as somehow proof that you're somehow not strong enough or that you're somehow not mature enough or that there's something wrong with you. I mean, a lot of EFT is validating, honoring, and holding people's emotions, walking, setting up experiences where they walk into those emotions gradually and at the same time are safe in that experience because they have a, they're given a framework where those emotions are you know, understood, honored, validated, right? And um, our society hasn't been very good at that. We don't teach kids in schools about their own emotions or about the impact they have on other kids and how to have safe conversations. We don't teach that. I mean, it's insane. We teach kids trigonometry, you know, but we don't teach kids what I just said. And so that's n nutty, you know, and there are thousands of couples out there in the world. You know, I'm just going to give a, a talk, public talk, a few weeks, in a few weeks in Toronto in December um, called What Every Couple Needs to Know at the big museum in Toronto. And I really believe that, you know, this stuff is what every couple needs to know. There are thousands of couples out there who have no way of understanding the dances they're caught in, no way of, of understanding even their own needs. You know, you say to people, what do you need? And they say, I need him, her to stop nagging or I need the conflicts to stop or I need, you know, these kinds of, I need, um, my partner to be have more communication skills. These are huge. You know, they they don't know how to really go to the core of what they need and what they want. And we've taught people to be ashamed of them. So um, a big part of EFT is we help people understand their own emotional lives, their own the terrain of emotion, and who we are as bonding animals and. Um, when you can accept those needs, um, when you can accept, you know, that we're all human beings who need comfort and security and life is so huge, we all need to put our hand out in the dark and call, are you there, and have a reassuring hand come and meet ours. And when we can do that, we can deal with the dark and that's just the human condition. And um, that must that makes know. me think too that 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 must be how EFT approaches couples where one partner or another has like a deeper trauma history. Um, Absolutely. Yeah, that's right. And you know, I think EFT is particularly suited to helping traumatized couples, traumatized individuals. Well, in fact, what's interesting is, um, you know, we're talking about hold me tight educational groups and that's only been around for a while and this is what happens in EFT there are 
things have sprung up, you know, like there's now a Hold Me Tight educational group called Hold Me Tight, Let Me Go for teens and their parents. There's a Hold Me Tight educational group um, based on the Christian version of the book Hold Me Tight, which is called Created for Connection, which looks at, you know, how Christian beliefs fit in with attachment science and the link between those two. Um, you know, there's a there's a there's a hold me tight um, educational group for in medical settings, which is very interesting. The the biggest one we've just done, which we've just got a huge grant for in Canada, is um, the Big Heart Institute back in Ottawa has asked us to adapt the program, and I hope one day we'll we'll adapt the online program for this too. Adapt the program for couples we're dealing with where one person's had a heart attack because the research says that the best predictor of whether you have another heart attack is not the severity of the first heart attack or even the damage done to the heart. It's the quality of your most intimate relationship, Mm. right? And so the cardiologist actually read this research (laughs) (laughs) and said, oh, we're relational human beings. Ah, relationships really impact health ah we better get this crazy lady in and she can adapt her educational program to cardiac patients so we did that it's called healing hearts together and the preliminary data on it says it's great really works i ran a few of those groups and they were they blew my mind they were wonderful um you know so everybody needs to know this and the the uses of of creating this um knowledge about what matters in love and how love works and how to repair it and keep it is has infinite infinite usefulness you know in whether it's in therapy in educational groups and for sure we've got to take this stuff online you know um the hold me tight online was a huge project took us four years and oceans of grief and work. And there was a number of times when I really thought, what on earth am I doing this for? Uh, But you have to do it. If you feel that we all need this and that we, you know, this is sort of very basic information for us thriving and surviving, um, we have to make it accessible for people and so many things are online now you know you yeah must- and having having gone through the course online i can say that it's clear how much effort that you put in and how you tried to address different learning styles and give people lots of different examples and make it entertaining at times and, yes um, we even have cartoons yes which at first when my colleague said we need some a cartoon couple. I said, no, 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 no. You know, like, but yeah, we got cartoons and we've got music and we've got, um, we've got images and we've got me giving chats and other uh, experts giving chats and we've got exercises that we tailor to you. It was a lot of work, but uh, hopefully, the couples. This the idea is that it's accessible to everybody then. You know, um, what I would like, which is a complete silly dream, but, oh, no, it's actually not a silly dream. What I would like is for uh, Western governments, the government of Canada, for example, to say, okay, um, Sue, we'd like to make um, the Hold Me Tight Online educational program available to all couples in Canada or, or everyone who's just got married or something. We'll make it incredibly cheap. Will you help us do that? And I say, of course. And I was just going to tell you that's impossible, and I forgot that actually a, a much simpler version, not at all the online program we've got now, but a much, much simpler pared-down version, the government of Finland has actually just helped my Finnish colleagues um, make the, the their version of Hold Me Tight Online, a very simple version of it, available to almost all Finnish couples, which wow. blows my mind. Um, but they've done that because they believe that stable, loving relationships and stable, loving families create 
stable, caring, positive, thriving societies. And of course, they're right about that. You know, that's the way to do it. So, um, yeah. So why am I talking about this? I don't know. Uh, that <laughs> Hold Me Tight Online was a lot of work. and But at this point, I'm quite proud of it. And I'm glad that you enjoyed it and that you found it varied. We wanted to make it fun. You know, we, we, we made it for the people who would never dream of coming for therapy or even reading my book or even going to a group. So we thought, well, then we better make it we better make it fun, you know, because um, these people are used to having fun online. So we did our best. I, I think it's pretty good. It's just like everything we do. We're very pleased with it for about um, a year. And then and then we find ways that we could have done it better. And this is kind of classic. You know, I know that I'm going to feel the same way about my book, my therapy book that's coming out in in January, which is your EFT for individuals, couples, and families, but it's really a book all about attachment. I know that I'll be pleased for about a week and then I'll, I'll read it. And by next summer, I'll have found all the ways that I could have done it better. You know. <laughs> well, fortunately, that ensures new, new editions or new books or new versions and new conversations for, for the podcast. So I'm, I feel totally fine about that, that you're, yeah, that you'll be constantly improving. Um, Sue, uh, you've been so generous with your time and wisdom, and I, I do want to ensure that everyone has the the links so that um, they will be, of course, available on the page for this episode, which is neilsatin.com slash Sue and then the number three. And you can also, if you're interested in the Hold Me Tight online program, you can visit neilsatin.com slash Hold Me Tight. And, uh, and that will take you to a page where you can find out more about the program. Sue, I'm wondering if we can, I have just like two quick questions for you. Sure. They can be quick or not. It's up to you. But if they're quick, it's totally fine. The first was, um, was a, another take on when I asked you, you know, what are your favorite ways of, of kind of coming back when you, when your conversations have gone off the rails and you brought up changing the channel? Often, because we're such astute observers of our partners, it yeah. it happens that we notice that our partner is totally triggered about something, and yes. and so I'm wondering when you notice, oh, my husband is he's triggered right now. What do you like to do in order to help bridge the gap in that moment? That's a nice that's a nice question. Um, I think the best guide to this is what we naturally do with um, beings where the vulnerability is not so hidden, i.e. children and dogs. <laughs> <laughs> if you watch people with little kids or you watch people with dogs, which I find fascinating, okay, if you, um, they naturally, if they see vulnerability, if you watch them, they slow down, they lower their voice, they lean in, they give more attention, they give a focused kind of attention. You know, they might ask a question or they might reach with their hand. You know, I mean, it's fascinating to me. Let's just take dogs. If you watch dogs, um, I mean, I remember sitting in a Starbucks, I can't remember why I was doing this years ago, and watching all the people look on their cell phones and all the people completely avoid contact and just thinking, goodness me, this society, we're becoming lonelier and lonelier. And then I sat and watched and there was a line of dogs tied up outside the Starbucks on these posts, right? So they're all sitting there. It's a Saturday morning. So you watch all these people come out with their – they've looked at their phones the whole time. They're carrying – things and they're busy and distracted and it's a busy street so they've got to stop right and they look down and it was so fascinating to me how many people looked down and if the dog looked back you know particularly if the dog was kind of small and didn't look very happy you know, <laughs> <laughs> you know, these these distracted distant disconnected people would i couldn't hear what they were saying which i think helped actually because you they they I remember watching this man you put his coffee down and lean down and talk to this dog 
he was obviously comforting the dog, you know, like, oh, you, oh, you're waiting for your master. You don't want to be here. And like, then he reached out and patted the dog in the head. He gave the dog more focused, soft, slow, connected attention than he'd given anyone in that, you know, in that Starbucks for, you know, whenever, right? Right. I mean, it's, so we know how to do it. It's a question of tuning in and 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 giving it, right? And uh, unfortunately, sometimes we're not very um, balanced, so we'll turn and say, what the hell's wrong with you, right? <laughs> right, right. Well, I, that's why I love your the way that you put it, because I'm so used to saying, you know, you see your partner and they're triggered, but I love your um, articulation of when you see vulnerability, because that is what you're really seeing in that moment is your partner yeah. in a vulnerable space. And if you know that your partner is the kind of person who, when they're vulnerable, needs space, is there an adjustment that you make to to how you would respond to that? Would you just give them space and then revisit? Or is there a way to, to bring no, it up? I'd that doesn't? I'd reach and then give them space. Got it. I'd reach to say, I'm saying I am accessible. I am here. I see you, um, but I, I'm not demanding that you turn to me right now. I see you, and I, I I see that sometimes you need time when you're in this space. So I I'm just seeing you, and I'm here. You know that's a very powerful thing to do. You know, and good good parenting is that. You know, good parenting. Um, you know parents know their kids style and you know they do that they say you know um i've seen people do it in therapy when they start to really mend their relationship they say well i understand this is hard for you to talk about and you know i see that and you know maybe if i was when i was your age i couldn't talk about these things at all and um i just want you to know that i'm going to be here and I see how hard it is for you and I want to help you and I'm right here when you want to turn around and talk. This is amazing. This is an amazing invitation, right? Um, and, you know, people can do that. They really can. They can They can offer each other that kind of space and that kind of um, empathy, right? right? I take account of... I take account of your style of response, right? But for me to do that, I have to be feeling pretty safe. Otherwise, I'm busy dealing with my own emotions about the fact that you don't talk about anything and that leaves me alone. And if I'm stuck there, I'm not going to be able to accommodate to you. I have to have my, my own balance if I'm dancing before I can accommodate to you in that way. Right, right, yeah. And so that brings us full circle to how we how we take care of ourselves when we recognize that we're in distress and and take responsibility for how we're feeling in the moment. Yes. Yeah. And you know, I think a lot of it is many of us are dealing with relationships which happen very fast in a busy world where there's lots of demands on us. And I think the central issue is that many of us have, don't even know what's possible. We've never even seen, um, you know, the kind of relationships that we talk about in these programs and in EFT and therapy where people can defuse conflicts, stand together against a negative pattern, find a way to be accessible, responsive, and engaged. People haven't even seen it. You know, they've seen a bit of it in Hollywood, which is usually infused with sexual infatuation They've seen little kind of moments of it, which I think is great. Okay, I think that's great, right? One of the ways movies and, and you know, books have always civilized us, right, in some ways. But they don't really know how to get there, you know. Um, so lots of times we're trying to create relationships where we really don't have a model of what's possible at all. And, and that's why I hope therapists who like EFT – will, um, you know, will maybe think about running Hold Me Tight groups, um, will maybe try the program, the, the online program themselves and tell their clients about it or tell their, their communities about it because so many of us 
don't even know what is possible, you know, in our relationships. We, we don't, we haven't even seen that these conversations can happen. And when we know that, the world changes, you know, our sense of what is possible with other people changes. This is, this is a huge thing, right? Mm, it's true. And I've definitely seen that in my own connection as well as it's evolved through our patterns of conflict and, and beyond, which has been nice. And your work has definitely been helpful for us as well. So I'm so appreciative of that. Um, so my last question, and you you talk about dance a lot, and yeah, um, well, that's because I dance tango. That's yeah, why. Yes, and and I think we've even talked about it on the show before because my partner Chloe and I do dance as well. Um, but I I'm wondering for someone who's listening, they're like, this all sounds great and amazing, and I want to try, and it also sounds like a little heavy, a little intense. What do you what do you recommend for people in terms of like keeping things light and and is there are there actual ways that you incorporate lightness and play and fun into I'm how sure. you work with people yeah Well I do couples therapy because it's more fun and more interesting than anything else personally mm. um, and I I when I run hold me tight groups I I think it's fun I certainly hope our online program's fun or we've completely failed. Um, it doesn't have to be heavy all the time. Um, learning can be fun. It can be intriguing, fascinating, um, surprising. But, you know, like when couples feel like, oh, we're just, we're so stuck and it's going to take all this work. And there's some truth to that, right? It's going to take some work to for them to shift their patterns. And yet, um, yeah, it's. I think it's more about discovery if you're feeling i think it all boils down to a sense of safety um my sense is couples come to see me and in the first few sessions it's not fun at all because they're scared and they're worried when they start to relax with me and we can play and we can look at the the dances they have and we can look at how normal they are and we can play with them and share them and we can look at how stuck they got and see how silly it is in some ways. You know, um, I mean, EFT is not always heavy at all. Uh, we have a lot of laughter and people don't launch themselves into these, you know, huge, heavy conversations. They're very gradual. Um, and we, we make safety as they do it. So it's, it's not all heavy. It's you take it at your own speed, and um, for sure, it you know people find it intriguing. You know um, the dropout rate in EFT is really low in our studies and in and clinically in practice. The way people report to us, um, people stay. You know, sure it's heavy sometimes, but. But people stay because they're learning so much, and it's 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 an amazing journey. They're learning about themselves. They're learning about their partner, and you know, there's a huge amount of fun in there. Yeah, and you're reminding me that some of, honestly, some of the funniest moments I think in my relationship are when we like after we've recognized a pattern, which is one of the the early things that you suggest couples do is how they identify what are the patterns that they typically end up in patterns of conflict and then when you're able to see it happening and you're able to have those moments of like look at us like we're doing that thing that yes. we're just doing it again and it can be hysterical you know chloe and i will be in the middle of it and we'll just like break out laughing yeah. from a place of pretty intense conflict when we have those moments of oh yeah like, that's us just doing that thing again. But, that's right. Yeah. You know, it's like um, I can think of a dance analogy. You know, um, you can be dancing with a partner who who you trust a lot and the partner tries a very tricky move. I can think of one where the my, my teacher, who's a fantastic dancer, tried a very tricky move and I sort of got halfway through the move where he was going, right, and then I got my – high heel caught in the hem of my pants. <laughs> <laughs> and basically, we both nearly fell down flat on, the, okay, we nearly fell. 
and and then it was hilariously funny. You know, it wasn't it wasn't oh how stupid of me to get my heel caught or oh how stupid of you to ask me to do that move. It was like it was just funny. You know, we were we both recognized that we would try and do something where we felt very clever and very intricate and you know if we'd pulled it off, we would have thought, oh, wow, aren't we incredible? And it didn't work. And it, one of the reasons it didn't work is because, you know, you don't account for things like high heels get stuck in in pants. Right? <laughs> um, and then we both laughed like hell. And it was it was good. It was funny. You know, it's it's a shift in perspective, right? Yeah. Well, Sue, thank you so much again for your time with me today. And and I know that everyone listening has gotten a lot out of this conversation. Uh, Again, neilsatin.com slash Sue3. If you want the transcript, text the word passion to the number 33444 or visit neilsatin.com slash hold me tight if you want more information on the course. Sue, I'm looking forward to your book coming out in January and checking that out. And uh, that will be a great resource for therapists. Yes, it's called uh, uh, Attachment Theory in Practice. I don't think I said the name. I always forget to say the name. Yeah, That's that's totally fine. I think I did say it at the very beginning, (laughs) but here we are at the end. So it's good to remind everyone. And uh, I hope that we get a chance to talk to you again sometime soon. Oh, I'm sure you will. Nice to talk to you. It's always fun to talk to you, Neil. Likewise, Sue. Okay, take care. Thank you for listening to another episode of Relationship Alive. If you like what you've heard and want to make it easier for other people to find out about us, please take a moment to subscribe to our podcast and to rate and review us on iTunes. If you have questions or comments or want to continue the conversation, you can always join our Relationship Alive community Facebook group. And for more information about today's episode, visit us online at neilsatin.com slash podcast. Or you can always text the word PASSION, P-A-S-S-I-O-N, to the number 33444 for more information. Finally, do you have a burning question that you're hoping we can have answered here on Relationship Alive, either for a future or past guest? Let me know and I'll see what I can do. Take care and see you next time.